as I said last time, and it's not my quote, this is from uh, Rodney Dorber, who's a, a medical doctor who is truly a specialist on nails, and he's written the definitive work of it, The Science of the Nail Apparatus, which is a very large book that cost me about 120 quid in uh, 2002, 2003. If you can get it now, God knows what it will cost you, although somebody has probably cost, copied it and put it on the internet by now. So you never know. Nonetheless, um, if you can get a copy of the book, and if, you, if you're willing to invest what it costs now, then I would recommend Science of the Nail Apparatus by Dorber, Barron and de Berker as being everything you ever wanted to know about nails and some things that you didn't want to know about nails as well. So there's a plug for the book and no, I don't get a commission on it, but it is an excellent work. And as Rodney Dorber says, the nail is a window on the physiology of the body. And when it lacks its physiology, it's an indicator of disease and it is an indicator of toxicity. So, example in cases of poisoning and things like that the nail is very often the first go-to part of the body that an anatomist or a, a pathologist would be looking at um, if they dig up a course and they want to know what uh, what killed it so let's revise the structure of the nail which i'm sure you're all fully familiar with but nonetheless we have the nail plate itself which is a trilaminate structure. So think of plywood. It's in three layers. You've got the ventral layer, you've got the intermediate layer, and you've got the dorsal layer. Or if you want to be medical, the dorsal lamina, the intermediate lamina, and the ventral lamina. And all of those layers of the nail have slightly different features. Um, they have uh, a different feature insofar as the strength of it, is, insofar as the structure of it, insofar as the, the actual um, the, the fluid component of it, which in most of it is very small, but the nearest thing to uh, having any fluid at all is in the intermediate structure. Um, it is essentially an avascular. It's a durable keratinized structure. And as we know, keratin is the major structural protein in the body, um, in the human body and in other vertebrate bodies as well. So certainly in our body, it's part of hair, it's part of teeth, it's part of nails, it's part of the stratified squamous epithelium of the skin, the hard corny out layer of the skin. And in other vertebrates, it can be scales and so on and so forth. The actual design of the nail itself, you have the lateral nail folds, which are the cutaneous borders of the nail at the side. So that's where the nail usually sits on the side of the, of the pulpy bit. Um, in pathologies, of course, such as in growing toenails, it actually dives down into the underlying tissue as well. You have the proximal nail fold, which is the visible border of the nail, and that's continuous with the epinychium of the nail, which is the cuticle of the nail. And the cuticle, of course, which is beloved of beauty therapists who love to insult it and damage it with various tools that they push down the cuticle and they put other things on the cuticle to dissolve it, to soften it, and to all sorts of nasty things to it apparently blindly unaware of the fact that the cuticle serves a very, very important purpose of actually keeping nasty things out of the root of the nail. And if you damage it, you damage it or you, you open it up at your peril, which of course keeps a lot of people like us in business because people come to you with paranychia and various other infections of the nail structure, the adjacent uh, structures to the nail. So it keeps us in business, it keeps me in business with prescribing antibiotics and various ointments and creams and other pills, potions, and lotions for it. Um, nonetheless, I, I do wish they would stop doing it. I'd, I'd happily give up that section of my, of my business if they would just stop tinkering about with the, uh, with the cuticles. Nonetheless, they, they love them. They will always do it. Then you have the matrix of the nail, which of course is the root of the nail. And that's the cavity from which the root of the nail and the nail grows. And different parts of that cavity, the roof, the back of it, and the bottom of it uh, originate various parts of the layers, various laminas arise from differentiated parts of that cavity, the matrix cavity. Then you have the lanula. You can obviously spot the link word there of luna because it's the crescent shaped section at the bottom of the nail that you can normally see, which is the convex margin of the intermediate matrix of the nail. And then you have the nail bed, which is the vascular bed upon which the nail rests. 
Now that is highly vascular, as any of you who've knocked your nail and had a bleed under the nail will attest to. And quite interestingly, that vascular bed, the nail bed, if you examine the bed itself, once you've taken the nail off, you can see that there are actually ridges going along it. Those ridges are almost like train lines for the nail structure to just grow evenly forward on where damage hasn't occurred. Then you have the distal margin of the nail bed where it ends towards the end of the, uh, the toe or the end of the finger. And you've got the hypernychium structure, which includes um, a not well differentiated part called the solen horn that sits just underneath it, which is the cutaneous margin. And that underlies the free edge of the nail here. And then you have the distal groove, which is otherwise known as the limiting furrow of the nail. And the limiting furrow, furrow is the demarcating border between the pulp of the, of, the, of the finger or the toe and the actual subungual structure, the structure under the unguum or the unguis, which is the nail in Latin, for those of you who love your Latin. Now, let's start to look at the nail plate itself and adjacent structures in detail. And these are the kind of things that we skated over very, very quickly in that first presentation. How can you image the nail? Well, obviously, and perhaps sometimes medical doctors forget this, one of the best imaging systems for the, na for the nail, be that the fingernail or the toenail, is actually to look at the thing and consider what you're looking at with your own eyes or with things that will assist the action of your eyes. But if we want to get a bit more technical, then if you try and x-ray the nail, uh, then you will reveal a little or nothing of the structure of the nail itself. And normally x-rays uh, will only be of value in assessing adjacent structures of the nail or what it, what it sits on. Now, this is something that I'm sure many of you like me will encounter when somebody comes along with a tented nail where the actual middle of the nail um, longitudinally is arising in like a tent shape in the middle of it. And very often that can be caused by a subungual exostosis. Now, as we know, an exostosis is a little bit of bone appearing where a little bit of bone shouldn't be. So it's the end, the end of the phalanx, be that once again, fingers or toes, same thing. I mean, the structures are the same. And you can have a little part of raised bone there, usually quite poor quality bone because it's adventitious bone. Um, but nonetheless, that can be enough to push up the middle of the nail. And then in compensation, the sides of the nail can push down into the grooves at the side of the nail and you can have an ingrown toenail, for example. Um, and that will show up relatively well on an X-ray. Um, when you do X-ray it, especially the exostosis itself, you can often see that it's much blurrier than the adjacent bone of the phalanx uh, because it's relatively low quality bone. There's a lot of bone salts been laid out and laid up down in the adjacent tissue. So it almost has almost a ghostly appearance to it on an X-ray uh, when you see an X-ray plate. Although having said that, I'm sure that uh, most of you will find as I do now, if I order an X-ray, then I don't, don't really get to see the X-ray plate. I just get to see the, the report from the consultant radiologist which in my case is very good because I've always struggled to actually figure out what I'm looking at on an X-ray plate. So if I've got somebody, an expert pointing out to me what is there and making the diagnosis, I, it's, that's always much appreciated. Um, so it can show subungual exostosis um, fairly well. It can show underlying bone cysts, which of course can be a problem. They can be a painful problem sometimes. And it can show how the actual phalanx bone can be involved in, for example, a subungual squamous cell carcinoma. It will highlight where that thing is actually attacking the adjacent tissue, um, which can be useful because we do see, as I'm sure you do from time to time, various cancers that will appear under the nail or adjacent to the nail. Uh, and it can also show, by obscuring part of the bone, the involvement of the phalanx, the end bone of the, of the digit, uh, in glomus tumors. Now, <clears throat> glomus tumors are, uh, they're, a, they're an epithe a, a, a neoplasm. They're a neoplastic tumor, essentially. They're not usually um, 
they're not usually malignant. Um, there's a possibility, I suppose, of malignancy developing in any any structure that's that's made of of tissue, but it's unusual, I believe, to see a glomus tumor actually being malignant. But there's an involvement there of the vascular system. Uh, there's an involvement there of the of the nerve system as well. So they're kind of a mixed up bit of tissue. And this is an image of a glomus tumor sitting on. There we go. So if you can see my cursor, I'm circling my cursor around that mass of the glomus tumor there. And uh, I got that image from Radiographics Online, which I put the link under there, obviously to acknowledge where I got it from. But also you'll find that there's a lot of useful information on that site. If you want to uh, disambiguate yourself uh, with um, radiological imaging, uh, it's a good source of information. Um, what we did without the internet, uh, I almost forget now. Uh, I almost forget going to the library at university and having to wade through these things called books. Now I just click on the internet. It's amazing what you can find. But yeah, radiographics, pretty good site to have a look at. So that, that's a glomus tumor. And uh, that could normally be excised relatively simply. Uh, it might leave a bit of damage behind it. But nonetheless, that would show up in imaging like that. Other ways you can actually image problems with the nail. Uh, is MRI. Obviously, they will show things up that an X-ray won't sh show up. So they're pretty good for tumours and periungal neoplasms. So little bits of tissue growing that shouldn't be there. They have little value, once again, in the nail structure itself. Once again, your visual observation of the nail structure is one of the most powerful tools that you've got. Now, of course, you can help your visual observation by using various gadgets. My go-to gadget and you can see it in, in image there, is a dermatoscope. Uh, and dermatoscopes can be um, quite expensive and very fancy uh, or relatively cheap, not so fancy, but still fairly effective. And you can, with some of them, combine them with digital photography. And you can also get some dermatoscopes now that will clip onto your iPhone and things like that remarkably cheaply. Um, unfortunately, when I bought my dermatoscope, um, you couldn't get things that clipped on your uh, on your iPhone relatively cheaply. So I ended up paying the best part of a thousand quid for one of these, um, which is a derm light. And it's a remarkable little device. Uh, it's as you can charge it up. It's got a power pack in it, so it can illuminate and it can illuminate what you're looking at with polarized light or direct light. So it's got polarizing LEDs around the outside of it. You've got a contact plate that you can extend like that. And you have a nice little viewing port there that you can actually screw a digital camera to. Now the kind of image that you've seen taken on the screen there has been taken with this derm light. I think they're a lot cheaper now. I think you can actually buy them for as little as 750 quid. Um, if anybody feels an urge to rush out and buy one. They are very good, I hasten to add. Would I buy one again? I'm not sure whether I would actually you know, do that because there are alternatives. You could, for example, buy one of these. Now, the dermatologists amongst you will recognize a traditional dermatoscope. Once again, you've got batteries in the bottom of it. You've got a, a bulb unit here. With a magnifying unit, you've got a contact plate there that you press onto the tissue that you're imaging. And you can get various heads. You can get um, gradients that clip on there that actually show you the diameter of what you're measuring. And if you go onto eBay, you can probably buy something like that for about 40 quid. Complete. With a nice velvet case. Um, obviously, it would come from China. Or somebody over somewhere over there anyway. Um, does it work? Yes, it works perfectly. Uh, it's rather heavy. I mean, this is made of steel, this is. So you could actually beat somebody to death with it. Or you could, if a patient refused to pay you, you could hit them around the head with it, which possibly the Health and Care Professions Council wouldn't agree agree to. So if there's anybody from the HCPC listening, that was a joke. I, I haven't hit a patient today, I can promise you. 
But something like that can be very effective. The downside is you can't attach a digital camera to it. And of course, digital cameras can be particularly useful uh, because of their ease of use. As you see there, where I've actually imaged what turned out to be a subungual melanoma. Um, that was quite a few years ago now when I was uh, doing some training in one of the dermatology departments of the, of the local hospital. Um, but in order to get an image with a decent dermatoscope, you need some of this. You need some contact gel. Now, this is basically a water-based uh, gel that you would use with ultrasound, for example, or you could use KY jelly, some of the sort of thing. And you can see that at the top of that image, there's a thing like a bubble. Well, that's because it actually is a bubble. It's an air bubble in the gel that I put there. And then the contact plate of the dermatoscope, or in this case, of course, it would have been the, the dermalite, the contact plate is pressed against it there and you can get a nice even image and the illumination from your device can actually shine into it and it can it can really differentiate the colors very well which of course with something like that you do need to do um, but combine those with the naked eye and they're very good tools indeed uh, so that's um, that's a slightly more modern version of the derm light there I think those are the ones that you'll find on various websites, which I, I won't promote the website, uh, but if you search, you'll find one. I think you'll probably pay about £750 for that, whereas the one on the left, this traditional dermatoscope, um, you'll pay £30 or £40 for. Uh, but both both do the job. And I would recommend the, the study of dermoscopy to anybody who has anything whatsoever to do with the skin. And of course, in our job, um, we're looking at the skin all the time. We're looking at the skin virtually every minute of our working day. And uh, there's so much information available online. There are so many decent free courses that's available online from organizations such as Skin, the charity, that give you online information that show you how to recognize skin cancers and various other lesions using devices like this and also using your naked eye. So I'd recommend the study of it to anyone and anybody with a computer can get themselves into a reasonable level of proficiency with understanding what they're looking at in the skin or in adjacent structures such as the nail. So that's the imaging side of it. Let's consider clubbing. Now, once again, this is something I whizzed over very quickly when we were talking about clubbing initially. But when a nail is clubbed, and uh, from the image that you can see in the center of your screen, you can see a halux, a big toe, on the left that is clubbed, and a halux, a big toe, on the right that is not clubbed. Now, admittedly, the foot on the right is a smaller foot anyway, but nonetheless, you can see that the morphology of those digits is completely different. The one on the left, the clubbed digit, uh, looks like the end of a drumstick essentially, whereas the one on the right looks what we'd, we would expect a decent halux to look like. And there are various stages of clubbing. And the first stage, as you can see on the left of your screen, is a normal appearance and a normal angle of the, the nail and the nail bed, but an increased fluctuancy. And by that, they mean it's a bit more springy than it would be normally. And stage two is where you start to lose the angle between the nail and the nail bed. And by the angle, if I can show you on mine, the angle I'm talking about is here. So you've got that, imagine is a straight line, and then you've actually got the nail structure itself that goes up like a ski jump. That's called the lovey bond angle. Now I know it sounds like a character out of um, a 007 movie, and I've no idea who Lovey Bond was, but I assume there must have been a Dr. Lovey Bond. I can only imagine what they put on their, uh, put on their, you know, their business card. Lovey Bond, doctor. It's got quite a ring to it, hasn't it? But the Lovey Bond angle is that angle between the proximal nail fold and the nail at the location of the exit of the nail from the nail fold. Now, usually that will be, as you saw in my relatively healthy digit, you saw that this angle like that is less than 180 degrees. Now, as you can see on the left of your screen, stage two is a loss of angle. So it 
literally flattens out. So there is, if you look at my first digit, I would show you my toe, but it's a bit, it's a bit high to get my toe up to the camera sitting in front of the computer like this. And it's probably illegal anyway. I'm sure the HCPC would, would not approve of it at all. Naked feet on in the evening? No, not good. Uh, but you can see on this finger that I don't have a lovey bond angle. Now that's not because I hasten to add, I've got inflammatory bowel disease, pulmonary ma malignancy, asbestosis, chronic bronchitis, COPD, cirrhosis, congenital heart disease, endocarditis or fistulas. It's simply because when I do my quite bad DIY, I've often hit that finger when I'm trying to knock a nail in. So I've irredeemably damaged the structure and I've got rid of my lovey bond angle. But that is a digit without a lovey bond angle. So as you can see, that would be a stage two on the left of your screen. Stage three is when the curvature of the nail, and you can see this quite clearly in the photograph, to the left of the photograph, the big clubbed one, the curvature of the nail increases at the end. It starts to go down instead of just being flat. Then you've got stage four, which is the expansion of the terminal phalanx itself. And then you have that characteristic classic uh, drumstick appearance there. So that is a clubbed nail. It's otherwise known, or it certainly used to be known as a Hippocratic nail. And it used to be known as a Hippocratic nail because the terminology of this clubbing was first described by the Greek physician Hippocrates about 2000 years ago. Um, I'm sure that Hippocrates didn't call it a Hippocratic nail any more than Morton called a neuroma, a Morton's neuroma. Um, those things tend to be assigned to them after the person is dead and gone. But this is nonetheless known as a Hippocratic nail. And he observed it because when he used to dissect a cadaver, uh, he often found that where there was a buildup of pus in the pleural cavity or in the lungs, uh, empyema as it's termed, he observed that they had club nails like this and he recorded it in his writings hence it became the Hippocratic nail. Now the things that can cause Hippocratic nails or clubbing call them what you will as I put up there can be inflammatory bowel disease pulmonary malignancy asbestosis chronic bronchitis chronic obstructive pulmonary disease COPD cirrhosis of the liver congenital heart diseases endocarditis, endocarditis which as you know, is, a, is an inflammation, an enlargement of the endocardium, the sac around the heart, and fistulas. Now, um, fistula, just to disambiguate something that was highlighted to me last time, this is the fistula, how can a fistula cause something to do with your nail? Well, of course, there are many different types of fistulas. Um, there is, of course, the, the fistula, and this is the disambiguate, disambiguation of it. An anal fistula is a small tunnel that develops between the end of the bowel and the skin near the anus. Now, of course, we as podiatrists are not really interested in that. Um, and they're usually the result of an infection causing a collection of pus in the nearby tissue. Um, but you can also have a fistula, this, this, this ch channel actually develop um, all, all in other areas of the body as well. Um, surgery is uh, recommended in most cases, as you can imagine. Um, but you can get these arteriovenous fistulas occur in the lungs as well. So you can see the connection with the Hippocratic nail. Uh, they're also known as a pulmonary arteriovenous fistula. And they're caused by a genetic disease called uh, Osler Weber Rendu disease, which is also known as hereditary hemorrhagic tymangiectasia. And that causes blood vessels to develop abnormally throughout the body, but especially in the lungs. So once again, lots of things happening with the lungs do tend to cause this clubbing. So if you've got somebody's naked foot before you and you see that they have developed clubbing, then, okay, don't immediately write to the doctor and say, well, this person has got cirrhosis of the liver or congenital heart disease. It's up to the doctor to spot that. But you could certainly highlight to the doctor um, just gently, that it's an area of the body that they may not have seen, and they might perhaps be interested in the fact that there is uh, evidence of clubbing in the digits of the foot and requesting uh, 
requesting their advice. That's usually a good way to uh, keep a doctor on site is ask for their advice on a subject. Don't give them a diagnosis. Um, but nonetheless, it can be interesting for you, for your records as well, to keep this and make a note of it. And uh, it adds a little bit of interest to what you're doing. Now, coilonychia. Now, once again, this is a shape and a structure change, and it can be caused by iron deficiency anemia. And you will see a thread running through this as well, in the same way that with the clubbing, you had um, a thread running through it. Um, with this, the thread is iron deficiency anemia, uh, hemochromatosis, Raynaud's disease, systemic lupus erythematosus, genuine trauma, nail patella syndrome, and I will disambiguate hemochromatosis for those of you who don't recognize it, and also nail patella syndrome, which is fairly interesting. Um, also, I haven't put it up there, but you will often see this in the nails of neonates. So that spoon shaped nail, it looks as though you could actually lift some of the soup out, out of your bowl with it. Um, so that's a coilonychiac nail, but it can be in a neonate. Um, child's uh, you know babies essentially very young babies and sometimes you will get um, distraught mothers bringing the children into your surgery saying oh the nails are all deformed you know oh, my, you know my little baby's all deformed um, worry not because coilonychia is not uncommon in neonate nails and it is of very little significance as well because as the nail grows as it develops the coilonychia depression will very often disappear. Um, if it doesn't disappear, if it persists through their childhood, then obviously there are other things that need to be examined. But if it's just in a baby, you know, reassure the worried mother that it's quite a normal thing in a very, very young child. And uh, just ask them to, or suggest to them that they, they keep their eye on it and then they can, uh, you know, they can highlight if it doesn't go away, but it will almost invariably go away. Um, just to disambiguate hemochromatosis and uh, nail patella syndrome, <coughs> and thank you to HealthNet, by the way, which is another good source of online information, healthnet.com. You'll see a lot of good stuff on there. Um, dis di disambiguate hemochromatosis, well, it's a disorder in which extra iron builds up in the body to harmful levels. And it can come about as a number of ways so you can have primary hemochromatosis which is also essentially hereditary or in inherited uh, by it's inherited through genetic mutations and they control how much iron is absorbed from the diet um, so for example you and somebody with hemochromatosis could eat a, an identical amount of liver for example and the person who's got genetic mutation could absorb a huge amount of iron from it whereas you just absorb you know the normal amount. Um, there's secondary hemochromatosis, which is also called secondary iron overload or hemosiderosis, uh, and that's caused by too much iron in the diet or too much iron from uh, blood transfusions, such as transfusions that treat severe um, anemia. Now, this hemosiderin or hemosiderosis, uh, you'll sometimes see that as a brown staining in the skin. Uh, quite interestingly, I've got it on a couple of, on one of my forearms. No idea why, because I don't have any any particular pathologies that would explain it. Um, but it's that brown staining, essentially, where the iron component of the blood is leaking out into the surrounding tissue. Or as I tell my uh, some of my worried patients who uh, present with hemosiderin staining on their lower legs, which is not uncommon. So well, essentially, you're going rusty, Mrs. Smith, and you can usually get a laugh out of them. And uh, it it calms them down a little bit. It's quite harmless. It can be, of course, uh, a symptom of the fact that they could have severe hypertension. They could have chronic venous insufficiency and things like that. But in a normally healthy person, it's of little significance. Although, once again, this is one of those things that can be a signpost, if you like, which is, once again, you, you see how all of these things signing things towards the nail and the nail is signing things towards other things, how everything interacts and interrelates in this wonderful thing we call the body. 
Then you have quite a rare condition, fortunately, because it's quite a nasty condition. And this is neonatal hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis in the neonate. And it's caused by an injury of the liver uh, whilst the, the fetus is in the womb. And this causes uh, extra iron to build up in the liver and the other organs of the, of the, the baby, which can be quite dangerous to them. Uh, but once again, you probably won't see much of that in, in the kind of the things that we do. But you just need to be aware of the fact that it's there. Then nail patella syndrome. Uh, it's a rare genetic condition and it cause, can cause problems with the nails, the bones and the kidneys. Uh, thumbnails are most severely affected. Toenails are usually less affected by the condition. But bear in mind, these are quotations from a medical book. And a lot of medical books are written by medical doctors who don't usually see feet. Um, so the toenails might actually be affected equally by nail patella syndrome. It's just they haven't noticed it. Um, but quite interestingly, on the lower limb, you can sometimes see that the kneecaps may be missing. Or they might be small. They might be irregularly shaped. They might be clicky. They might have clicky knees. And they might have knee locking or the knees may feel unstable or painful. So once again, that can be of relevance to what we do in our profession. Uh, you may decide that uh, you might be able to help to stabilize their, their gait by appropriate supports in the shoes, for example. There are many other manifestations. Genetically, there's a one in two chance of inheritance from affected parents. So there's quite a high inheritance rate there if the parents have it. And if you have a look at that link on the bottom, because obviously this PowerPoint will be shared for those of you who want it. Um, then if you look at uh, nhs.uk backslash conditions backslash nail patella syndrome, there's a lot of information on it there. And it's worth a read for what we do. Now, onycholysis, um, which is a shape and structure change as well, can be caused by psoriasis because a lot of things that affect the nail can be caused by psoriasis. It can be caused by infection. It can be caused by hyperthyroidism, so an excess of thyroid hormone. Sarcoidosis, which I'll disambiguate in a bit. General, general trauma can cause it. Amyloidosis, which I'll disambiguate as well. And connective tissue disorders. So, for example, um, any one of a number of connective tissue disorders. Uh, can cause it. So it's not a specific, it's just rather more of a general signpost. Now, once again, this is from dermanet.nz, which you'll find on the internet. And that is one of the most fantastic sources of information on everything to do with dermatology. It has got literally thousands of images there. It's maintained by New Zealand dermatologists. It's free to access. Uh, you could spend the next six months reading through it and if ever you want to disambiguate some of the images you're looking at on the skin it can be a very very useful resource indeed uh, they're happy for their images to be used for educational purposes you can also apply for permission to use the very high quality images as well that they can make available to you provided you you acknowledge where they come from but if you're ever puzzled by anything on the skin and you want to look up a good source of information that's properly managed by genuine dermatologists, um, then I would recommend dermnet.nz to you. So what is sarcoidosis that I mentioned in relation to onycholysis? It's a rare condition that causes small patches of red and swollen tissue called granulomas, which we often encounter, of course, by the side of an ingrown toenail, don't we? A pyogenic granuloma. And it causes them to develop in the organs of the body, it usually affects the lungs and the skin, but it can also affect the um, areas under the nail, which is skin. Um, so it can cause tender red bumps on the skin. It can cause essentially the death of the, of the bottom layer of the nail. It can cause shortness of breath, a persistent cough. So once again, <coughs> we've got something to do with the lungs that affects the nails, haven't we? Common thread of uh, dear old Hippocrates and his pus-filled lungs. Um, amyloidosis, um, once again, is a protein problem. So it's the name of a group of rare and serious, quite serious conditions caused by a buildup of an abnormal protein called amyloid in organs and tissues throughout the body. And as that protein, as the amyloid builds up, it can actually make the organs and the tissues fail to work properly. 
and without treatment this can lead to organ failure coke so it can be a very serious condition a very serious life-threatening condition and one of the first flags and signposts can be something that you see on the nails um, it can cause kidney failure heart failure peripheral neuropathy it can cause easy bruising in its early stages and so on and so forth so once again a useful signpost there for those who wish to look at it pitting of the nail and this is something that's particularly dear to my heart because the number of pitting pitted nails i see are probably as many as the number of pitted nails you see um, it's also sometimes known as thimbling uh, for those of you old enough to remember thimbles when we used to sew things uh, then the surface of the thimble was covered with very minor depressions wasn't it um, and there's a thimbled nail so you can very very clearly see those minor depressions that look as though somebody has just jabbed something in the top layer of it very good image here from once again a very another good site it's got a lot of information if you want to go trawling through the internet is pocketpharmacist.net that's uh, aimed at pharmacists but they're not proud they don't mind us looking at it as well so if you want some information on a variety of techniques, a variety of things, have a look at Pocket Pharmacist. So the causes of this pitting can be many and varied. Psoriasis is usually the favorite. Somebody turns up with a nail like that. The first thing I say is, do you have any skin conditions? Have you got any parts that uh, are irritated, that itch, or that you notice um, something like eczema forming in the flexure regions where your limbs bend, where your joints bend? the skin of the surface over those and very often they say well yes I've got this bit of eczema and so and so and so and so and you look at it and you see it's it's something like gutted psoriasis um, so you can usually um, usually you know put their mind at rest of what they've got no it's not it's not eczema uh, Mrs Smith it's actually psoriasis uh, oh it's caused by my stress etc uh, writer's syndrome which or rata however you want to pronounce it uh, i'll disambiguate that in a minute in wonderful title of incontinentia pigmenti and i think i've actually missed a, an eye off that i think it should probably have two eyes on pigmenti and alopecia which you, many of you may be familiar with anyway uh, so let's disambiguate those writer's syndrome or rater's syndrome otherwise known as reactive arthritis now this is a condition that causes redness and swelling um, various types of inflammation in various joints in the body especially the knees so that's of interest to us especially the feet which is of interest to us as well the toes the hips and the ankles and it's an autoimmune disease caused by inflammatory synovitis so basically the synovium of the joint the the synovial membrane of the joint that actually produces the synovium the slippery lubricant of a synovial joint becomes inflamed and you can also notice once again on things like MRIs that there's erosion at the insertion sites of ligaments and tendons and it can develop after an infection sometimes a relatively simple infection and somebody will say ever since I had this infected you know little finger um, I've had joint pain etc etc if they say that that's a really big red flag so you know consider that it might be something like reactive arthritis a reactive arthropathy that can affect the whole body uh, it can be caused by sexually transmitted infections which may not have any external um, sign or it can be caused by food poisoning even so it's something that's worth perhaps getting yourself familiar with because if you get somebody with unexplained joint pains then it might be an idea to say have you had a recent infection or something like that that you think could have provoked it or even have you ever had a an episode of food poisoning uh, it's most common in men um, although women can get it as well and it's most common in people aged between 20 and 40 for some reason so i'm pretty safe at my age i don't think i'll get uh, reactive arthritis anytime soon age has its advantages people uh, and then of course you've got incontinentia pigmenti which is a genetic ectodermal dysplasia affects the skin, the hair, the teeth, the microvasculature and the central nervous system. And basically it's kind of a blistering out, a rash, uh, often begins in uh, childhood, then it heals and it can be followed by the development of harder skin growths. 
and the skin can develop gray or brown patches. Some of them brown patches fade with time, but other symptoms can include eye abnormalities. It can lead to vision loss and blind. So where you appear to have a tram line in a nail or pitted fingernails and toenails. And there can be quite a few associated problems with that. And that can include delayed development, uh, intellectual disability, seizures, various other neurological and problems, neuropathies, etc. Most males with the disease uh, who develop it um, literally in the womb don't usually survive to childbirth. So more often than not, uh, it will be a lady who has this or a female child. So that's incontinentia pigmenti. And I've no idea where the name came from, but it, it sounds quite horrendous, doesn't it? Alopecia, you're probably familiar with, but it's an autoimmune disease resulting from a breach in the immune system of the hair follicles, basically. They are no longer able to do what they should do. And essentially, the, the failure is the body's ability to recognize its own cells. So you've got immune mediated destruction of the hair follicle. So it kills an area that the hair grows from. And uh, you've got a patch of alopecia there. No idea where this photograph came from. I just put alopecia into the internet and it popped up and there was, there was no, um, no reference to it. So I can't refer who it came to. So if you happen to know this person, then please say, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to put the reference there if you, if you know them. Although it might be hard to recognize. Um, Bose lines, Bose lines, shape and structure change. It's essentially, they're like the lines in a, in a tree, a tree ring. So any severe systemic illness that disrupts nail growth, such as Raynaud's disease, pemphigus, which I'll disambiguate in a bit, and trauma. Once again, these are great images from dermnet.nz. And you've got two really good examples of Bose lines there. So this ridge that goes across the nail, that signals that there has been some event that caused damage or interruption to the nail matrix, to the nail root, severe enough to stunt its growth for a very short period of time. And then it grows up. As you can see, those are growing up. So the one on the right, for example, would be a few months old. Um, so Raynaud's disease, pemphigus trauma. Let's have a look at pemphigus for those of you who may not have come across it again. Raynaud's disease, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. That's when people get uh, white toes, white fingers and things like that. Uh, very painful. Uh, it can certainly be painful uh, as it forms and then as they get the flushing after Raynaud's disease when it warms up again. Uh, and Bose lines, um, by the way, do come from uh, Joseph Honore Simon Debo or Simon Beau. Some call him Debo and other call, others call him Beau. And he was a French physician. And his main area of interest, a very severe looking chap there, um, he was noted for his investigations of the heart, the physiology of the heart and the lungs. So the lungs were involved again here. He made one of the first descriptions of cardiac insufficiency and in asystole, Bose syndrome. And he described Bose lines in... Uh, Notez sur cet on caractères de semiologie rétrospective présentées par les Anglais. And if you're, if you're French, I do apologize. That was probably the best French accent you ever heard. And that was published by, back in 1846. So, you know, it's something that we've been familiar with, thanks to uh, Joseph Bow, for quite a long time. Semiotics, by the way, is the study of sign processes, which essentially we're doing here. Uh, Pemphigus. Um, Pemphigus vulgaris, to give it its full name, is a rare and serious, potentially life-threatening condition. And this is why it's good to compare this to something else that's very similar to it, that causes painful blisters to develop on the skin and the lining of the mouth, the nose, the throat, and the genitals. The blisters are very fragile, and that's the key. That's a key word to this, and can easily burst open, leaving areas of raw and healed skills, skin that are very painful, and they can put you at risk of infections. It's essentially, and this is something I'm sure that many of you will come across, have come across, it's not to be confused with bullous pemphigoid. Um, probably every couple of months, I'll see somebody walk into hospital or clinic, wherever I am, uh, and they'll have these, these great big blisters on their leg. Uh, and that, of course, will usually be bullous pemphigoid. And here's an example of bullous pemphigoid. Um, 
as you can see, a huge blister that um, the usual treatment, it's essentially, it's, it's an autoimmune condition, basically. And very often it's in more elderly ladies uh, and can be very worrying to them. And uh, sometimes people will come to you, um, be referred to you because the physician didn't really spot what it was, which is rather surprising because it's relatively signpost, well signposted in medical literature. But you can see there that there's one blister that's active and there's another blister that has uh, basically been punctured and it's caused damage to the skin underneath it. It's caused that staining and it's caused that uh, keratinization, that, that scab essentially that's there. And that cycle can go on for quite a length of time. Then all of a sudden they disappear. And then maybe a year, two years later, they come back and the whole cycle starts again. Um, so bullous pemphigoid affects a deeper layer of the skin than pemphigus. So they're harder to break. They're harder to break. And obviously these are things that don't essentially cause life-threatening changes or potentially life-threatening changes. Um, pemphigoid um, can look like hives or eczema without blisters sometimes. So it's a worthwhile, you know, th a worthwhile thing to, for you to perhaps have a look at in more detail yourself because you will encounter these things and then decide how you're going to treat them. Usually a physician will puncture that and then put a sterile dressing over it. Um, usually I will as well if they're, if they're in a nu nuisance area. But you then have to have pretty careful management of the person so that you don't actually provoke, a, provoke an infection. Um, occasionally, to terminate it, I might give them a mild steroid cream, prescribe a mild steroid cream. But I'm always a bit, a bit wary about steroids because obviously it is an autoimmune condition. I don't really want to screw up their immune system any more than is necessary. Uh, yellow nail syndrome. Uh, sometimes called yellow nail syndrome, sometimes just called yellow nail. Um, and that can be caused by lymphedema, plural of you. This is from Dermnet NZ, by the way, that image again. Wonderful people. Lymphedema, pleural effusion, immunodeficiency, bronchiectasis, I'll disambiguate that, sinusitis, rheumatoid arthritis, nephrotic syndrome, we'll mention that a bit more, thyroiditis, tuberculosis, or Raynaud's disease. Um, or, of course, something like that can look pretty similar when it's actually a nail fungus, can't it? But a lot of the things we've actually looked at, certainly including um, this yellow nail syndrome, certainly including uh, onycholysis, will often get referred to you um, as nail fungus. And a lot of the times, not nail fungus. Um, but these people might have been um, determinedly treating this as nail fungus for ages, or their physician, their doctor, might have been giving them course after course of tabinophene or sporanax or anything like that, which is a systemic drug. Um, tabinophene, I'm relatively happy to prescribed if somebody has uh, a healthy liver. Um, the other one, uh, Sporanax, which is itraconazole, which is a pulsed medication. I'm not because I don't like some of the potential side effects of it. Um, but sometimes somebody will come in with uh, yellow nail syndrome and they've been on uh, Lamisil tablets, for example, for six months. And you send away a sample. I mean, you look at it and you say, well, I don't think that's a nail fungus. You send away a sample for culture, microscopy and culture, and it comes back completely clear. So it's obviously just the yellow nail syndrome and they've had uh, six months of quite a powerful drug therapy that was entirely um, unnecessary. Um, so dear old Raynaud's disease, as I said, can also be an originator of this. So what is bronchiectasis? Well, it's a long-term condition. Once again, the lungs are involved where they become abnormal, the airways of the lungs become abnormally widened. And that can lead to a buildup of excess mucus that can make the lungs much more vulnerable to infection. And if you've ever known somebody or if one of your patients has bronchiectasis, then you know to hear them coughing and choking from time to time is quite distressing because it can be a very persistent cough. And very often it will bring up some quite thick sputum and they can be breathless a lot of the time as well. Um, so once again, the lungs are involved in something, can be involved in something to do with the nails. Nephrotic syndrome, um, as the name suggests, is a condition that causes the kidneys problems and it causes them essentially to leak large amounts of protein into the urine. And that can in 
includes, the well, consequences of that can include swelling of body tissues, a greater chance of catching infection, water infections, and so on and so forth. Nephrotic syndrome can affect people at any age, um, although it can often first be diagnosed in children aged between two and five years of age. Uh, usually affects more boys than girls. And that has nearly filled the hour up. So we've had 55 minutes of it. Uh, as I say, if I've gone on to talk about treatment and nail surgery, then we'd certainly still have been here at 11 o'clock. So treatments will be the next webinar and then nail surgery, perhaps with some of the more uh, description of some of the more exotic types of nail surgery. Um, will be in version two and version three, which we hope to do at monthly intervals. And for the nail surgery one, I'll probably trot out our Dean of Surgery as well. We'll bring him out, dust him off, and we'll get him to have a chat as well, Bill Liggins. Uh, he's a bit of an irascible chap, but he's quite nice. I've known him for years. And uh, we can, between us, we can uh, uh, perhaps broaden the subject of nail surgery. And I would imagine we can perhaps show you a couple of videos as well of some of the more adventurous types of nail surgery. So you know what to expect and your patients know, know what to expect. It's not meant to be a, a description of do-it-yourself nail surgery with a pair of kitchen scissors, by the way, but it will enable you to, you know, to identify which various things, which various types can be done and why they can be done. Because sometimes people will say, well, you know, why don't do it? Why not do a partial nail avulsion when something like a Weinergrads or a Zardex procedure might be more effective and more beneficial to the patient? Or you might be trying to remedy a, a failed, uh, failed nail surgery from somebody else. Usually, dare I say it, a GP who's tinkered with the nails and uh, you sometimes have to remedy it and you can't just remedy it by doing the same old system. So you have to do something else. But what we're trying to do, um, is perhaps add a little bit of interest, a little bit of excitement to these webinars, because I know it can get quite boring when I'm droning on. And at the end of each webinar, we're going to uh, trot something out as a question to all of you. And uh, this is something I saw, but equally it might be other things that other people send in. And uh, what I'm inviting all of you to do is to look at this condition which presented to me about three weeks ago. And as you can see, it's on a leg and quite a poorly leg of quite a poorly lady, actually. And she's very distressed by this. And if you could possibly have a look at this, if you want a bigger version of the picture, then if you email head office, email to Jill, Julie, um, Sandra, whatever, at head office, and they can send you a bigger version of this. Now, I did take this on my phone, so it won't be a really high quality one because I didn't have my digital camera with me at that particular place. Um, but have a close look at it and consider it and decide what you think it is. And once you've decided, if you want to enter the competition, then just send in uh, your description of what you believe it to be uh, and what treatment you believe would be appropriate for it. Um, etc. So, you know, a, a description of this. Um, as you can see, you've got quite a large neoplasm uh, heading up towards the knee. You've got other areas that look, at the, look as though they've been excoriated, that look as though they've been scratched. But that's where previous of those large neoplasms existed, but don't exist now. So there's a great potential for infection in this limb. Um, in Point of fact, I believe that the one towards the ankle is infected. Um, it looked quite suspicious when I saw it, so I, I put her on a course of antibiotics. And I will actually be um, reviewing her um, in a week or so uh, to see how it progresses. But if you would like to, uh, to respond to this, then this is the basics of it. So it's a, it's a lady, she's 89 years of age. She's actually not in, in bad in bad health overall, um, but she does have a few problems. She's not taking medications. She doesn't have any reported allergies. Um, I can tell you, here's a clue, it's not traumatic damage. Uh, this particular case appeared about four months ago, she tells me, and these neoplasms, these great big lumpy bits there, they appear and then they regress fairly quickly. 
and she says it's not painful. So what would you think it to be? I've asked Jill and the girls at head office to put together some kind of prize for this. Now I'm gonna bring Jill in here. Jill, if you're there, could you unmute yourself? Hi Martin, I'm here. Hello, Jill. Jill, what what wonderful prize have you put together for the for the first person who describes uh, what this is and how they would treat it or how they think it should be treated and what the potential developments of it are? No. Have you put together? Is it a huge box, bottle of whiskey? Is it a hundred pounds? What is it? It's a surprise. <laughs> it's a surprise. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have a student, goodie bag of of sorts. Right. Okay. So. I assume it's not a hundred pounds then? Sadly, no. <laughs> it's not a, not a bottle of whiskey? No. No, all right. <laughs> well, we've eliminated two things there. So I I will watch with bated breath to see what is in this goodie bag. And uh, any complaints, please, for the from the winner, any complaints to head office, please, don't send them to the chair of the council. <laughs> Just send them to head office because I'm going to be on holiday in a way for a week or so. Uh, I'll be very interested when I come back from holiday to see what, what has come about of this, because it's quite an interesting condition. Now, I know what it is, obviously, because I've seen this before. And I'm sure that some of you might already have a clue as to what it is, because there's a couple of clues there. So we know it's not an allergy. Uh, we know it appeared four months ago. And in those short four months, since four months ago some have appeared and some have regressed and it's not painful so um answers answers by email jill will that be yes please um if i've, I've put my email address in the chat box but please send it to jill j i -L -L, at iocp.org.uk right okay um well that just remains for me to say, well, it's now just after half past eight. So we've filled an hour with that. Um, we'll have at least another two of these. As I say, the next one will be the medicines um, and the various therapies and so on and so forth. And we might even need to do two of those because there are lots of different therapies emerging on top of the, the traditional medicines that can be used. Um, lasers, for example, and things like that. So we'll probably be still be talking about nails <laughs> For a long time this year but I, I hope that some of you enjoyed it and I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, I, I wish you a, a peaceful night and uh, as my friend hot dog says uh, there hot dog advises be vigilant out there as our pussycat is being vigilant with a mask so take care folks and uh, have a good evening okay good night